So what is there to say about CNC accessories? Well, stick around and you'll find out. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel and love CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest updates. It's literally there and just takes a second. Now in today's episode, we're going to be talking about CNC accessories. Slightly surprised I got that out in one go, but let's carry on. Now the reason this came up is I was doing a job recently and I realized there's a lot of tools I use on a regular basis that I don't really talk about in my videos, but they make my life so much easier. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into them. Some of them may seem obvious, but hopefully you'll still learn something along the way. But more importantly, I also want you to let me know if there's any accessories that I'm not using that could make my life easier, because at the end of the day, I'm always learning. So let's dive in with the first one. They're in no particular order, but we're just gonna cover them anyway. So let's take a look now. So first we have a ruler. Very basic, I know, but stick with me till the end of the segment. It does turn into more. So first, this it measures in millimeters. It also measures in half millimeters on the bottom edge. So you've got a choice there between both to be more precise. Flip it over, it also measures in inches. Now for me, this is really important because I help a lot of people out in the States. I also help a lot of senior people out who still use Imperial. So it's great to be able to have both as a reference together. But actually the really important thing about this ruler is it is part of a set. And if I bring this in now, we can see what this set is. It's called a combination set and they're typically made up of four parts. One being the ruler, you then have a center finder, an angle finder, and a square. They all obviously have their own purposes. I don't use the angle finder so much, so we'll just quickly talk about the center finder and the square for now. With the center finder, what you basically do is you put the ruler through it. I'll do this quickly just for demonstration purposes. You have something like a circular disc. You place that on edge to edge, draw a line, move it round, draw a line, move it round, draw another line. Where all the lines intersect, that is where the center of the material is. So quite often people do do CNC jobs starting from the center of a circle. That is how you find the middle of it. So that in itself is very useful. Now the square itself, this is probably the most useful part of the kit for me along with the ruler. So if I put the ruler into the kit now, Obviously you can see this has a groove in it. It just helps to keep everything aligned. As soon as I can get them the right way, there we are. So if we put that in place now, and what we can see straight away is that creates a square edge along here. This is brilliant for testing whether your material is actually square or not. So obviously if something's not square, this may throw out how your job comes out on the machine. So that's one advantage in itself. If we slide it all the way down to the end, bring that in flush, lock it off, it can also work really great when you're trying to tram your machine or set your machine up. You can put this on the bed and it gives you a nice straight square edge to work from if you're trying to adjust or level up your spindle. So again, that has uses in itself. If you're working on a smaller machine, you can't simply just use the square edge as the, the square itself effectively, putting it on the bed and that gives you a smaller version of it to test whether things are square. It can even be used as a fairly basic form of doing um, a depth test. So if I just put this back together. Now what this can allow you to do is obviously if you set it flush, drop it to the edge of something, let the ruler drop down, lock it off, and then that gives you the basic depth of whatever you're working with. So I say it does have multiple functions. It's probably one of the tools I use on pretty much every single job I do. Now, this particular one is by Moore and Wright. I'm not going to lie, it is a pretty expensive piece of kit. The reason for it is it comes calibrated to quite a high level of accuracy. Now, if some of you are probably turning around and going, oh, well, I've got a speed square or something similar to this that does the same job. One thing I will promise you, this kit is a lot more versatile and you will get a lot more out of it than something like a speed square. And if you are buying a high quality one, it will also be much more accurate usually than these speed squares. They are called a speed square for a reason. One, yes, you can get a rough edge, but it's not necessarily always guaranteed to be 100% accurate. If you are unsure whether your um, square is actually as square as it should be, the quick way to test it you go to something like your work surface, lock it off to be square, put it to the edge, draw a line down it, flip it over, go back to that same line, draw another line, 
if the two lines are perfectly straight and on top of each other then your square is square if they have a slight veer out or veer in then something's not right and that's the easiest way to know whether your square is truly square so next up we have clamps and as you can see i've got a variety here from the different machines that i have now the question always comes up what is the best clamp to use now the honest answer is all of these clamps as long as they are used correctly are going to hold down the material enough for whatever you are machining so to some degree there is no such thing as the best clamp there are better ways and different methods to hold material down depending on how you are machining or whether you're going edge to edge and i'll move on to that shortly but for the time being all the clamps that come with your kit even down to the little ones that you get with the 3018 series of machines they're going to do the job correctly as say as long as they are set up to hold the material down right now when i talk about holding the material down right you either want to make sure your clamp is parallel with the top of the material or pointing slightly down the biggest issue that people often do is have their clamp pointing upwards and that effectively pushes the material out of the way so it's about to point downward pressure on the material as opposed to lateral pressure pushing it away and this applies to those clamps it applies to the ones that have got a slight kink in them or the ones that have got an even bigger crank like these ones off the fox alien 4040 xc as i say they all work they all do the job as long as they're used correctly and that's why they have these bolts on the back for leveling the clamp up and keeping it level and then it allows the cranked part to put that downward pressure onto the material now going back to what I said earlier about the right clamp or setup depending on what it is you're machining. Now as we can see some of these have got different size cranks on them and obviously that is going to result in a different height or profile based on how it is being clamped down. So if you are machining something say in the centre of a piece of material you can afford to have these higher cranked ones because you've not got to worry about the machine coming too close to the edge. However, if you are machining quite close to the edge, you may want to try and use a lower profile one where you can just grip the edge of the material there and the router can come so far across without worrying about hitting the bolt. I mean, alternatively, these are long bolts, so you can also put short bolts on them or do something like I've done previously. And you can add, there we go, getting messy, add even longer bolts if you need to, to raise the height of the clamps. Now, as I say, it's all about the different types of material and the way you are clamping down. Occasionally, I will use these clamps upside down just to put lateral pressure and push it into another clamp. As I say, just as a way of securing things down. And if all else fails and you are struggling, go back to what is always my fail safe which is CA glue and blue tape. It holds the material down really well. And I often use clamps and this together, especially if I'm cutting all the way through material, because it just guarantees those pieces will stay in place. Obviously my preferred is Starbond. You'll always find a discount code in the description area below the video. So next up we have nylon sanding brushes. Now these were a game changer for me when I found out about them because they just make life so much easier when cleaning things up. The setup is relatively simple. You have a lot of nylon bristles, bolt through the middle, clamping everything together. And the joys of them is they come in different grits like sanding paper as well. So I've got a 200, I've got a 600 and I've also got a 400. And you then just put them into a pillar drill or even a hand drill like this. And obviously then once you spin it, it basically becomes an easy way of sanding. Now, one of the reasons these have been so effective for me recently is I've been doing more 3D relief carvings. So if I bring in the wolf's head that I did recently, you'll see there's a lot of deeper areas around the eye and it can be difficult to clean up. Also with all the intricate um, detail going on, you can't really get sandpaper in there so it can get quite fiddly. Now, all this was cleaned up with was one of these nylon brushes. I put the 600 brush on the pillar drill and ran it over this a few times to clean everything up. And it really makes life so much easier. As I say, definitely a game changer for me. And yeah, well worth the investment because they're relatively cheap as well. I think these were something like £15 for the three of them. And they have so, saved me so much time in cleaning jobs up. And as they were off Amazon, I'll also put some links down in the description so you can find them and order them if needed. So next up we have dust boots or dust shoes, whatever you want to call them. They're essentially the same thing with the primary purpose being of extracting as much dust as possible as your machining. And even if you have an enclosure, they are still useful to have because it can minimize the amount of fine dust in the air flying about. 
Now we've got two different styles going on here. I'll start with the ones on this side. So this is what I had on my 3018 Pro and basically what it does is it gets pretty close to where the spindle is and extracts as much dust as possible. Obviously the vacuum goes in the top there. The blue version is just a bigger version of the smaller one, except this one fits on the Prover XL, the 4040XC and also the Vasto. So same job, just different size. One thing that I like about these as well is although this fits onto the actual carriage, they come with clips. So you can take the clip off, I'll pull that out of the way, and that can lower down. So you can get a bit closer to the material depending on how deep you're going into the material. So there's some flexibility going on with it. Um, these are both can both be found off Etsy. I'll put links in the description area. The two on this side are more traditional dust boots. The primary difference really is it it encases the whole spindle and the bit itself. So obviously everything's going on with inside the brush area and you can't really see what is going on in terms of is it cutting correctly. So they do have some disadvantages, but to be honest, they probably extract more dust than these do because we, these typically sit one side of the spindle and bits can fly off in any direction as it's cutting. Whereas because these are enclosing the entire spindle in bit, it catches a lot more material. So yeah, these are probably the preference, but as you can see, they are bulkier in size difference. So it kind of depends on how tight your setup is. And the two that I have going on on this side is the Saint Smart Gen Mitsu one. This will fit your standard 300 watt and 500 watt spindles. I did a review recently on this one. I'll put the link up in the corner. And we have this one, which is what I use on my Dewalt router that is currently on the Prober XL. This was basically homemade. It's 3D printed with a bristle strip glued on the inside. One thing I like about this version, it is essentially clips to the um, fitting ring that goes on the Dewalt router. So it just clips on and it makes it nice and easy to put on and off. And because this winds up on the thread on the router, I can move it up and down slightly. So there is some flexibility, especially if I'm cutting deeper into the material, I wanna raise it up a little bit, say putting too much pressure on the bristles. That is also the other thing I should point out, is these are designed to almost touch the top of your material as it's machining. So if you're machining something deep, it will start off touching the top of the material. And the deeper you get, it's gonna put a lot of pressure putting down on that going into the material. So it can almost cause your machine to work harder because it's having to force it into the material. So that is just something to bear in mind. Now, in terms of buying these, you know, they're available on Amazon, on Fox Island, Saint Smart site. If you want to look at 3D printing one, head over to Thingiverse. There are tons of different designs. Um, so you, yeah, you really do have plenty of options with the dust boot. And it's just about finding the best one that works for you. So I said there was no order to this, but I've probably kept the tool that I use most until last, so almost the best for last, which is my set of calipers. They're also called vernier calipers. I'm sure an engineer will probably pop up and tell me what is the correct name for them if I've said something wrong, but I just call them calipers. Their primary purpose is for measuring things, and there are different ways to measure things with these, which I'll move on to very shortly. But the reason I find them so versatile is because Whenever you're starting a job, first you need to know the size of the material. If it's a small piece of material like this, for example, I may use the calipers as opposed to using something like a ruler because they will be more accurate. More importantly, I use it to measure depth, especially when you're cutting through material. So if you're cutting through something that is around 20 millimeters thick, you need to know how, de how deep that is to judge how far you travel through it. If it doesn't go deep enough, then obviously it won't cut all the way through. But equally, if you go too deep, you're gonna start taking big chunks out of your spoil board. So this gets me very close to the obviously depth of the material. And let's say it's 20 millimeters, then I'll set the cutting depth to something like 20.1 or 20.2. So it just allows me to be more precise when cutting through material. Now there are a few different types of these. These are a digital set that are made out of steel. They're not expensive, I think they're about 18, 20 pound off Amazon. You can buy um, higher quality ones that are to a higher calibration, but these do for what I need. What I probably would say is I used to have a plastic set like this. 
they were okay but what i would say is the metal set and much better partly because as we can probably just about see on cam the plastic has actually bent so they were okay for a while but they are extremely cheap and flimsy so if you're going to pick some do at least go with the metal set they don't need to be the expensive ones but stick with the metal set i should also point out these are a digital set as well obviously you've got the digital readout if i slide that out it comes on so it gives the accurate reading. You can also get manual ones, which is where you use a calculation system off the ruler markings to determine the, um, you know, the measurement that you're trying to take. But again, for ease, I stick with the digital ones because you know the readout is there. You don't need to work out the markings aligning with each other. So it just makes our life much simpler. Now, in terms of the ways to measure with these, there are three different ways really to measure things, but I'll probably show you a method that you are not aware of. Now, the three methods for measuring with these are usually the internal measurements, external measurements, and then the depth. So we have the um, jaws at the front here. So if I pull those out and just do an example, I'll bring this block back in. Now we slide that out and pull them in and obviously that tells us the width of the material we've got 99.85 millimeters showing there so that shows the external measurements now if i take that out the way and we'll bring in something like this circular roll of blue tape from earlier and we can use the two points on top to measure the internal diameter of that roll and we'll slide that out to make sure there is no play and again, it takes that measurement. Now, the now, third method is using these to measure the depth of something. Obviously, most people who use these probably know you have the pointy end there. And that is great if you're measuring something like a slim channel. But if you've got a block like this and you're trying to measure the edge of it and you put it on and slide it down, for example, what we can see is it's actually quite wobbly and it moves about a bit. So getting an accurate reading can be difficult. That's showing... 10.28 millimeters so if we flip this over we can see that they, this is ground flat so that they meet up together and this is the alternative method to measuring the depth now i saw this method on jody's channel um inspire woodcraft which i've never seen it done before but it is now probably my easiest way of measuring the depth so if i flip this over and just slide it up Drop it on the material. Now, obviously, because that's much wider flat area, it sits more stable. Then slide that down to touch the material. And we have 10.4. So it's probably a more accurate reading because there was less wobble in it. So it really depends on the area you're trying to measure. As say, if it's something like an edge where you've got a big enough gap to get that in, definitely do this method. It would be more accurate. If it's a smaller channel, then use the pointier end to go into that channel and measure the depth of it. But yeah, hopefully that is a new method. And as shown on my recent video for calibrating your steps, you can use them to really dial in your machine and get everything tuned to get precise output. So there we have it, the most common tools and accessories I use on a regular basis, and hopefully you've learned something along the way. For example, that alternative way of measuring depth with the calipers, I never knew about that, and it's really made my life much easier. Now, as I said at the start, do let me know in the comments section down below if there's anything that you use that I'm not using to make my life easier as well. I really hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please make sure you give it a thumbs up. Final thanks as always goes to my patrons and I will see everyone on the next episode.